Okay, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Thank you, Dimi. Thanks. All right, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for joining us and uh, filling up this uh, room in uh, uh, in uh, Katowice. I am very excited um, because uh, I think we have uh, not only a great conversation ahead of us, but also I have a great partner in this conversation um, for many reasons. My name is Anna Mazgal. I am executive director of Wikimedia Europe, which is um, an uh, association of European affiliates and uh, friends. And one of our key tasks, uh, we are based in Brussels, and one of our key tasks is to speak um, uh, on behalf, as mandated, uh, to be sure, uh, on behalf of our European communities uh, about the uh, challenges that we're facing if it comes to um, freedom of expression, access to knowledge, and any other topics that are relevant uh, for our projects to um, to thrive. Uh, and uh, one of the topics, of course, that we're looking at and also often asked about is AI, artificial intelligence. As we know, it's been um, uh, for some time now that uh, people are uh, thinking how make best use of those technologies. But of course, it also presents regulatory challenges. And um, it was actually... Um, Advocate General's proposal that we don't uh, make a super uh, legally in-depth talk about this, but we talk about it in a way that anyone can understand, which I think is wonderful uh, also, because I think this is one of the ways to also explain complex legal issues, to talk about them in a way that, that are not so complex. Um, so uh, I am joined today uh, by a first Advocate General of the Court of Justice of the European Union, Maciej Szpunar. Uh, uh, Maciej Punar has uh, uh, a very fruitful and amazing career as a lawyer here in Poland uh, and um, also as the Advocate General in the court. Um, maybe uh, we can say a few words about uh, what is the court of uh, justice of the European Union and what is the role of First Advocate General because I understand you are not a judge. Um, in the sense of uh, of giving uh, judiciary decisions, but I, what I do know is that in Brussels, when uh, uh, Maciej Szpunar's opinion comes out, the traffic stops. Everybody needs to understand because this is uh, a very important voice in how the uh, EU law uh, should function, right? Uh, so, so if you can please tell us a couple of uh, words about about the role of the court and uh, the role of uh, your your role in the court. Thank you very much, Anya, first of all, for inviting me here. It is my first, second experience with the Wikimania, Wikipedia. Uh, um, I must confess personally that I'm very much impressed by what you're doing, it's, and it's a great honor for you, for me to be here. And I also believe that, uh, that my presence would be useful from your point of view. As Anna said, I'm a lawyer, so I could speak for hours about legal stuff, which is not... Uh, particular exciting, but we believe both with Anya that we will try to to present the issues in a very comprehensible way. You ask me the first question: What's the Court of Justice, and what's uh, what's the role of uh, of an Advocate General and first Advocate General that function that I'm exercising now? And uh, I must say that the answer to this question would require half an hour, so I would try to be as brief as possible. The, court, the European Union has its own jurisdiction, supreme jurisdiction of Europe, uh, which is supreme jurisdiction in the sense that we have the last word on the interpretation of EU law. As you can imagine, EU law is extremely broad. Even EU institutions are accused of being uh, overactive in legislation, and our court uh, has its role to make this legislation comprehensible, to interpret this legislation. Um, it happened that I have been acting as an advocate general in many cases regarding new technologies. Everything, everything uh, protection of data uh, on the internet, uh, protection of um, exclusive rights like copyright over the internet, issues uh, uh, concerning um, uh, the combating, uh, combating of crimes committed over the, over the internet. 
because this is part of EU law. EU law has legislated in all these areas. Um, but in a nutshell, uh, unlike any other court, uh, the Court of Justice is composed of judges and advocates general. They are equal. Uh, as you can imagine, we have 27 judges, one judge per member state, and 11 advocates general. Uh, the division uh, is slightly different. We have six advocates generals coming from advocates general coming from six big uh, from uh, um, five uh, uh, permanent from big big member states, which is France, Germany, Spain, Italy, and Poland and six advocates general rotating among other member states. And our role is not to decide, but to tell the court what should they do. And the court can follow us or may not follow us. Uh, and then uh, mm, you, you would be probably tempted to ask a, a follow-on question. So what's the role if you are not followed? And I'm always saying that our role is not to be always followed, because if I tried to be always followed, my job would be, would be absolutely useful, uh, unuseful. It is absolutely so, useful now. Uh, yes, in the sense that our role is sometimes to provoke a debate, to say what is wrong in the case law, what should be amended. We do not care about consistency of case law. Judges should care about consistency, that the, the case law is consistent. We. Uh, are proposing something to the court. The court may not may, may follow or may not follow our proposal, but our role is also to stimulate a debate. So as a member of the court, because I'm an advocate general, I'm allowed to say much more today than if I were a judge. If I were a judge, I would be obliged to stick to the existing, existing case law. As an advocate general, I can say a little bit more than a judge. All right, so let's jump right into it. <laughs> um, thank you so much, uh, Maciej. I wanted to ask you first uh, about AI in general, uh, uh, not maybe uh, necessarily as Advocate General, but about you, Maciej Schwunar. Are you excited about AI and the opportunities that it brings? Or are you more, um, I know you're excited about your work and talking to it. And by the way, of course, I have plenty questions, plenty of questions, but also I want to make sure that whoever has questions here can ask them, right? So, so, um, uh, so uh, I, I think you're excited about answering them, but um, what are your thoughts about this? Um, do you see it, uh, this, this, this change that is coming uh, as full of opportunities or kind of a mixed bag of opportunities and threats? Um, do you think it's useful to you? Uh, again, as Maciej Spunar, but also as Advocate General, uh, what's, uh, what's on your mind? I am definitely very much excited by artificial intelligence, but one disclaimer in the very beginning. I'm a lawyer, and lawyers are always behind. We are, have certain backwardness. Lawyers are always behind technological revolution. And it's for a good reason, because we are not inventors. We are thinking about the consequences and how to adapt the existing instrumentario to the challenges stemming from new technologies. So uh, I'm excited, but I'm perfectly aware that I know much less about artificial, artificial intelligence than, prob than probably majority of you. I'm trying to think, to anticipate what should be the legal rules applicable to artificial, in, uh, artificial in, uh, intelligence. Just to give you one example, for us, new technology is the internet even though <laughs> we all deal with the internet for more than 20 years. But I can tell you that from a legal point of view, internet poses still very huge challenges regarding uh, law, regarding legal framework. How do we perceive certain transactions concluded uh, via internet? How we protect works uh, over the internet? How... Um, um, how we uh, proceed to the question of protection of personal data over the internet. These issues are not resolved. And if you look at the case law of different jurisdictions in the world, starting from US, China, India, the European Union, you would see that uh, uh, personal data are protected differently everywhere. 
Yes. Yes. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, I, I think that, uh, and I want to go, go into um, the European realm of legislation because I think uh, we in Europe are quite in the forefront of, uh, of legislating uh, on many levels uh, differently. How technology, on legislating where technology touches many, many areas of our life, right? Yeah. Privacy being one of them, but also now AI Act that uh, has been, uh, uh, has entered into force uh, uh, basically a few days ago, uh, if not fully, mm -hmm. then, then um, uh, formally at least. Um, uh, and um, I'm wondering also about this. Uh, I, I can totally see how uh, AI is part of this whole bag of, uh, of, of new technologies, but do you see any challenges here in uh, making sure that AI serves humanity, which I understand law is there to, to fulfill, that are specific to AI because of its, uh, for example, generative potential or any other aspect that, that, that you can see um, uh, that uh, basically looking into the future uh, may actually land uh, in your, on your desk? Definitely. You mentioned that the Union is the first entity in the world, probably, that enacted a legislation regulating AI. But you have to be aware that this regulation is very narrow, extremely narrow. The only thing the European Union did is simply uh, divided uh, AI system into several categories, uh, depending on uh, how dangerous is the, the impact of IA on fundamental rights. So there are systems that are not dangerous to fundamental rights in, per, uh, in the first place, the personal data, because that's that what, 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 we, what we care about, and those systems which are completely forbidden because they are too dangerous from the, from the point of view of the protection of, of fundamental rights. So this is a very narrow regulation. If I think, if I'm trying to anticipate, but I would only define the problems, I cannot give uh, definite answers because if, what, if, I, if I did so, I would be prevented from dealing with cases when, when it comes to the agenda of, of, of the court. But for me, when I'm trying to anticipate other problems of artificial intelligence that were, that, um, were not yet tackled by the European legislator, I would say, it's the first question is liability. Who is liable for uh, damage uh, done by artificial intelligence? And how should we deal with the restitution and, uh, and uh, mm, paying compensation for damages create, uh, created by artificial intelligence? Here we have some experience already on other new technologies that uh, that traditional concepts of liability um, have to be revisited. And another question is, um, I remember when AI emerged, uh, and it would be a little bit long answer, Anya, if you allow me, uh, lawyers started to ask question, what about copyrights? Who is entitled to copyright uh, in the case of, of works created by artificial intelligence? And of course, this is a very pertinent question, but I think more important question is what to do with the fact that AI is using all information created by others, that it actually nourishes itself uh, from the information created by, by other people. And this is a big legal challenge, because if we had uh, a system of artificial intelligence that, have, mm, that has access everywhere to all information uh, stored in, over the internet. Very often information uh, protected by copyrights or by other, other ex exclusive rights. Um, so if artificial intelligence has access to this information, formally there is no violation of uh, exclusive rights because we are not dealing with uh, um, communication to the public because artificial intelligence is not communicating something to the public, nor with the, um, uh, um, uh, I, forgot, <laughs> I forgot the word, another, uh, another use of, uh, of copyright where there's multiplication, multiplication of the work. So artificial intelligence does, does not uh, multiply the work uh, protected by 
the copyright. So we have to think, and this is the question for all society, and to ask whether system, systems of artificial intelligence should pay for the information to which they have access. I don't know the answer, but this question has to be, has to be uh, posed and, uh, and uh, very well reflected. Um, and as regards the first aspect that I mentioned, uh, uh, who is the owner of copyright of the works created by artificial intelligence, I would say that this is a part of a question uh, how we should protect intellectual property in the future. Uh, until now, uh, the protection of intellectual property, everything, copyright, trademarks, uh, trade secrets, uh, designs, is based on exclusive rights. So the author has an exclusive right to, uh, to deal with the work, to decide on the communication to the public, distribution, and, um, uh, and multiplication of the work. There are voices in the society of economists, lawyers, saying that we should stop and we should rather look at the protection um, of an investment. And I would give you one example, a photograph. Traditionally, each photograph is a work, is protected by copyright of a person who did a photograph. But the question uh, arises what to do in contemporary world where, where photos are made, uh, are made uh, automatically. We all have uh, cameras in our iPhones and, we do, and we're making photos all the time. Can we say that each time I click uh, something on my mobile, I'm creating a work, a work which, des which deserves to be protected under copyright law? Maybe we should uh, ask ourselves whether there was some time or money invested in this work and only on this basis great, uh, grant um, uh, the uh, protection and to give some rights to the, to the authors. That's the question to be, which is, which is open. There is one danger, uh, and I'm fully aware of this, uh, because we, are, you know, we have uh, in Europe this experience from the Third Reich and, uh, and the notion of de degenerated art that who will decide whether something is a work of art or not. That's a danger inherent in this, this, in this discussion. Um, I have lots of thoughts right now, but, um, but I start from the end because one other thing uh, that comes to my mind, and uh, first of all, I, I wish that uh, more people and lawmakers and policymakers in Brussels had such an open mind as you have about what is the future of copyright. We participated as a movement and specifically us in Brussels uh, also uh, in a very heated debates around the copyright directive, obviously, because uh, because uh, our interest is uh, to also you know protect public domain, right? And to make sure that it's not a nonsensical uh, protection where it's actually more benefit to the society is and no detrimental effect on the creators, right? To, to actually set content free. Um, uh, but one other thing is that um, uh, I, I would think that in the current setting of, of how those things works, uh, if we look at the protection of investment and effort, it's uh, well demonstrable by uh, basically big players and companies that when they have, when they make photos, they have, I don't know, a photo shoot, right? Uh, or they, if they uh, generate them artificially through artificial intelligence, they do it with system that cost a lot of money to deploy, right? And uh, so would that then mean that uh, if you make a beautiful photo uh, in uh, uh, Katowice um, and uh, even it wins an award, uh, uh, then uh, your investment was not that huge, right? Comparably, right? Because you just came and saw a beautiful sunset over Spodek and that was it, right? So uh, so would that not create a, um, a deeper divide that we do observe in protection of rights online that who has money and who has a platform can actually uh, effectively uh, sh seek remedies, uh, right? And who ha doesn't have it or is not even well informed enough sometimes, right? Which 
regular citizens sometimes uh, uh, simply are not uh, cannot basically protect themselves, right? So the AI would fe would feed on, which happens also right now on, uh, you know, uh, wedding photos uh, placed on uh, Flickr because they are openly licensed, right? But uh, but the works that are protected by investment and have the strong copyright enforcement in the um, uh, embodied by the lawyers in the companies are actually better better protected. Uh, it doesn't seem very equitable to me, right? So, can we think of uh, of any remedies that also protect citizens uh, in that aspect, similarly to to the big market players? And I don't know if these are legal remedies, right? Maybe these are remedies that come more from uh, you know state policies, right? Or I I don't know what um, um, or technology itself, maybe. Well, you tackled several issues in your in your question. The first is the notion of an investment. I have no answer to this to to this question because the easiest way would be say if you invested money, then your uh, your work created uh, the work you created deserves more protection. But it's not that easy because it's not only the question of uh, of money; it's the question of uh, what did you do. Uh, mm, where, did, where did you put this 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 piece of art? How uh, needed and appreciated is this piece of art? So, so that is mm, that is another issue. But you men but I think you you tackled a very important point, which is uh, which are legal remedies and uh, internet. But also, uh, it is my prediction: artificial intelligence completely shifted this paradigm of liability. We lawyer. Uh, that um, maybe some of you studied law, were always thought that uh, you had a tort feeser and a victim. So those who did the wrong thing and, and uh, a, then a person to suffer, uh, that suffered. And always the question was, what remedies has a person who suffered damage against the tort feeser? The internet and also artificial intelligent, in intelligence completely shifted this paradigm because as a uh, as a victim, let's say I created a work, and uh, this work, uh, my my copyright were violated many times, many times over the internet. I'm not re so much interested who is a tort fiso, who breached my exclusive rights. What I'm interested is to make use that uh, to make sure that this infringement will not repeat itself, that my work will be protected. And uh, the the work would not be circulated for uh, for for years over over the internet. So, as a victim, I'm rather interested interested in legal remedies against intermediaries like big platforms, internet service providers, than uh, the tort fiso itself. Let's say if my personality rights are violated. Someone said I'm stupid and uh, and uh, you know other uh, dirty things about me uh, on a, uh, in a post over Facebook. I'm not interested who did it. I do not want to even identify uh, identify the person who did this wrong act. But I'm rather interested in remedies against Facebook to make sure that Facebook removes this post and any similar post. So this is the change of the paradigm, and we should rather concentrate on remedies against, would say, intermediaries, so-called secondary liability against the internet platforms and internet service providers, those who have real means to make sure that my damage uh, does not repeat itself. Yes, uh, also because, uh, I mean, we see it already, right, that uh, it's humanly impossible to follow each and every yeah. case of an infringement uh, when we have every minute exponentially growing the pool of information, and, and I think we have to also face that. I'm pretty sure that there will be many questions about that aspect because this is also something that our communities looked into again during the copyright reform because that was also, I feel, the spirit of the... Uh, content filtering provision yeah. to to just go behind it, and we also discussed a lot the um, the um, uh, the kind of transfer of risk. Right, if the platform is the one that is targeted, then the risk is being transferred to the users 
in the in the effect of over policing the content right and we know this for example 17. yes exactly article 17 so um a uh, sore spot uh, <laughs> for our community but we actually managed uh, to convince the legislator that i genuinely think didn't want to harm wikipedia that uh, that educational projects and, and encyclopedic content is not there, um, but uh, I think we're going a lot into uh, something that we promise not to do. <laughs> but it's fine. It's fine. I think we, it's gonna be back. I wanted to bring um, a bit of a perspective that that is, uh, you know, our community is looking to because we are of course very much interested in copyright, not because our projects deal with copyright by design, but I would uh, venture a, 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 a comparison that we deal with copyright by contrast, meaning that. The content that is on Wikipedia is either public domain or uh, or openly licensed, and of course the vetting of the content is uh, among many other perspectives. From the perspective, if the content is protected, then it doesn't have place on on Wikipedia or Wikimedia Commons and other projects. So, uh, so from that perspective, we also look a lot into what is actually possible to release, uh, so that projects like Wikipedia and humanity in general can have access to. Our, our vision is that everyone can take part in the sum of human knowledge. So um, for this, the content needs to be, the free information needs to be free. Um, and I'm wondering if you see any uh, specific points about new technologies in general, but AI uh, specifically just because it also has this generative uh, power. And also I have a feeling that ever since we, we see those actual deployed tools like uh, um, um, ChatGPT and, and others that uh, like all data was valuable, but now it's really all data. Like any single piece of information is valuable for training purposes, right? So, sorry, it's a very convoluted question, but I'm, I'm landing my uh, uh, plane that is circling now around all those topics. That um, uh, my point is, what is the impact of AI on public domain, for example, in uh, in your opinion? On one hand, a lot is being kind of you know sucked in, but also, what is the output? Um, is there any chance when we talk about responsibility of ownership to actually be look for a chances to actually Open more con open more content, right? And here, of course, I operate on the assumption that AI is not only hallucinating; that it's also actually providing useful in outputs. Well, well, let's start with the basics. I mean, uh, everything what you create is in a public domain. So, even though formally you could be considered. Uh, as an author, as a, as a right holder, you allow everyone else to access this information. That's the whole idea behind uh, behind Wikimedia. Yes, formally uh, it is a work, but you give your consent uh, and give access to anyone. You you are entitled to do this as a potential right holder. And then the question arises: What is the scope of your consent? whether you agree that artificial intelligence would also be n nourished by this information. And here I would say there is a tremendous difference between giving or allowing any other person to look over the Wikipedia and to learn this information, to use, it, to use this information from allowing systems of artificial intelligence to, to be nourished by all information contained on Wikipedia. The law doesn't give any answer to this question because we are not yet prepared for this. But uh, as I said in my introductory, in my uh, introductory remarks, this is the question that will have to be tackled, because there is a tremendous difference between someone else reading Wikipedia and artificial intelligence reading Wikipedia. Uh, for a very simple reason. Uh, Chat GPT is not for free. Um, even if we do not pay, uh, as we know, we very often pay with our personal data and the information we, we put. You know, the artificial intelligence, and I will just give you one example from the work of the Court of Justice concerning this, this fact that, uh, that, the, that the systems of artificial intelligence has to be huge in order to be efficient. Our court functions in 23 official languages of the European Union. So we have 23 official languages. 
so a great challenge for us is the translation, is legal translation of documents. And we have our internal system of translating documents within the court, but, they very, the, but the quality of this translation is very poor. So if I put a text and use DeepL, you heard about the Deep, DeepL system, it's always better. It's always better. The translation did by DeepL is always better than our internal system for a very simple reason, that DeepL has access to more information and by definition is much more efficient. Uh, of course, for us it's impossible because our documents are not public, cannot be disclosed, that we cannot use uh, uh, systems like deep, yeah, like deep L in, uh, in order to, to translate our internal documents. But this illustrates that there is a danger uh, that with the development of artificial, artificial intelligence, only those systems who are the most efficient and have access to more information uh, would be really effective and, and would be used. Like Google. I mean, you, there are many uh, search engines over the internet but everyone is using Google for a very simple reason. It's much more efficient. The same would happen with uh, would happen with uh, with automatic translation. Only uh, the tra uh, the translation done by huge systems is accurate and efficient. Um, I I think uh, um, I mean. Yes, <laughs> so I'm just thinking about my next question and all the things you said, so uh, forgive my clumsiness sometimes. Um, uh, definitely the the uh, amount of data plays a role. I want to come back to this. I want to say that probably if we polled uh, our friends here in the room uh, and uh, hopefully those who watch us online, we would have very different answers whether people think Wikipedia should or should not be just easily accessible. And one of the things is that we believe that our system of vetting information works. So, um, so basically we provide good quality of information. Therefore, if AI... It needs to be trained. It's better that it's trained on Wikipedia than on Reddit. Yeah. Um, uh, I would uh, say that. And some of the people may say, which we also bring up a lot, is that um, in the current uh, you know, uh, uh, market uh, setup, which is technology, but also probably beyond, it's just that we deal with technology, um, the, uh, the um, volunteer work becomes free labor. Yeah just because this is how, how it works and there is no social return on investment made by our community from other platforms, right? I mean, we can argue they get better so people get better quality, right? But as you said, people already paid with their data, right? So, so just to say that this is a question that I think we also internally grapple with here and there will be probably people that are vehemently, uh, you know, supporting either side of, of this, uh, of this um, conversation. Um, I wanted to ask you about a follow-up to, to this because we also had this conversation uh, for, for some years about what we kind of uh, identify as unintended consequences of the open. Meaning that um, we open data and are happy for everyone to use. That's the premise of, of um, the licenses that are used for Wikipedia, for example. They are not limited. Um, uh, mostly these are by attribution or, or uh, zero license, which doesn't even expect that. Sometimes it's this viral form, which is the share-alike one, um, uh, but, but mostly are those. And uh, we do know that content licensed on those, uh, uh, used uh, that is licensed by those licenses is, for example, used by, um, this mostly is about images, uh, for um, uh, facial recognition training that then in turn is, of course, used sometimes for uh, in healthcare, yeah. but sometimes it's used to develop, uh, you know, a military um, uh, uh, purpose which some of us, uh, some of us, I think, and I respect this position, don't care that much about this because there is this, uh, well, uh, it's out of our hands. We are not responsible for other people's things, right? So, um, and what I'm getting at is that if we don't want this to happen, it seems, and the research showed this, that the only effective way of pulling out uh, publicly licensed or non-exclusively licensed uh, imagery from those training databases is actually to put copyright on them. Because this is what the companies respect. They don't want to have the copyright infringement. It's a, it's, uh, you know, a known way to 
to seek those remedies. But do you think there are also, uh, and we don't want to do this, right? We don't want to copyright Wikipedia because then it affects everyone, right? You cannot be half uh, open, right? Or half, in, half exclusive uh, in that aspect. So are there, do you, do you think that the, the law also will evolve uh, in any other area that can actually uh, bring also those other considerations that the AI, I think, specifically here brings on the table that uh, there, there can be some level of control of how the content that we produce is not good, not used for nefarious reasons? Well, one, one answer is what to, to, to uh, protect your, your work by copyright, but then I think that the whole idea what is behind your project, well, your wonderful project, would be compromised. Um, you asked me to to try to be to find some speculations. What would be other ways of protecting? Because I mean, everything uh, relies. Well, I mean, your problem on the fact that you want to have information you create to be accessible to other people, but you do not do not want other people to make huge money out of it. Yes. Or well, I think it's not that they don't make money because I think this is something. It's just that. Um, um, we see it and ends up uh, not being as beneficial to the society as maybe we would have wanted this yeah. to be, right? So the companies, uh, Google or, or whoever else, for example, we have uh, Wikidata, and I understand that uh, most, if not all, voice assistants yeah. that yeah. are proprietary are using Wikidata yeah. to create so information. So someone is making money yes. uh, out of information you create. Yes, and yeah. not returning to the society yeah, to the in society, any meaningful yeah. way, right? Yeah. On, on the contrary, right? Mm. Building more data to, to do predictive um, uh, advertising or, or whatnot, right? Well, let me allow to speculate. And uh, <laughs> as a lawyer, I'm always looking to similar situations that, ha that happened in the past. And what, what springs to mind is... Uh, uh, but I know that this analogy is very difficult. When uh, copying became very easy in the 90s, um, you know, with the um, photocopying, recording, and so on and, and, and so forth, uh, legislators of many states decided to uh, impose uh, certain lump sum money on those who are producing equipment for copying. And uh, this lump sum money is then distributed to to authors, to, to those who create, uh, to create uh, the content. Maybe an idea, but you know, I'm just speculating that, but this is something that would need to be uh, taken into, into account by, by uh, legislators, is to say that those systems who are making money out of information you create should pay certain lump sum money, because you will never identify how much G uh, Chad GPT earns on the information stemming from Wikipedia, but certain lump sum money should be paid and uh, and then distributed to you or to those who are working for you. These are the solutions which are equitable and are trying to bring justice, even though uh, they are, they cannot be measured because you will never you will never ident precisely identify how much money all the system would earn. Uh, thanks to the information, uh, to all information created uh, on Wikimedia, or Wik uh, Wikipedia. Um, I think we're trying to go that road. We, uh, the, the Wikimedia Foundation now has the project that is called Wikimedia Enterprise, yeah. and it is basically providing uh, uh, large companies who can afford this, uh, uh, if I understand correctly, um, uh, sort of a better pipe mm -hmm. to get the data so that uh, the, and then basically there's uh, money that uh, that comes back so we're definitely experimenting uh, experimenting that way um, there are probably other considerations I what I do like personally about Wikimedia Enterprise is that for uh, uh, non-profit projects it, uh, it is not uh, it is available but not for a fee because it's we treat them as part of the uh, uh, of of this whole ecosystem that is helping us, so so I think uh, I think there is uh, we can report back in a couple of years if you're interested uh, how that worked. <laughs> um, I wanted to to talk a little bit also about the the sort of you know um, I I think we have more and or less uh, you know a, a bit uh, all of us uh, catastrophic or not catastrophic thinking about uh, what's going to happen if we have this um, uh, wide adoption of the AI. Um, I sometimes think that we should be so lucky to have this uh, 
um, uh, very knowledgeable, very well trained, very unbiased uh, AI overlord uh, that helps us. But uh, unfortunately, my uh, I mean, I'm joking, right? But um, but uh, my uh, my uh, fear is that we actually what happen what may happen is that we end up with AI systems that are not well trained, that are not so great, right? And that they are being adopted because it becomes cheaper than looping humans in in the processes, right? And then to me, uh, it becomes also so a question again of equity and equal access, right? In which I can totally imagine that, uh, you know, uh, um, for I don't know, uh, uh, in this dystopian vision for a petty crime, you are dealing with a chatbot that is basically giving you a fine. But if you are, uh, you know, a, a, a big tax evader from Panama Papers, uh, you can afford to actually face a judge, right? And I'm not comparing the two crimes; they are different. But of course, that you know, the more means you have, generally, the, the more you have access to to uh, human decision making even if it's supported by AI in any way which we know happens in in some jurisdictions at least right so uh, where I'm getting with this uh, is um, uh, you mentioned that AI uh, act has a narrow um, field and yeah. and narrow perspective the perspective is of a risk-based approach okay. do you think that it's a good fundament to build upon uh, to remedy situations like this, that um, that uh, the AI that has low quality and is not well supervised, there's no human in the loop, uh, is not deployed where it actually could hurt people? Or do you think that we will be very soon looking at it, um, you know, again and revising and trying to build up other parts of this ecosystem to, to regulate those mostly generative technologies in that aspect? Well, again, a question that would require <laughs> that would require a very deep and 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 long considerations. Well, I will start by saying that as a lawyer, I'm very much in favor of access to justice. Access to the court is an essential element of the society, and um, with the developing and increasing complexity of the of the world that uh, surrounds us, we have to we cannot forget about access to justice. But there are two problems with this. First of all, is the technical knowledge of an average judge. I would tell you, even at the Court of Justice, we have excellent collaborators, we have excellent staff, but there are cases in which we do not have sufficient technical knowledge to be fully aware of certain consequences. I remember a hearing, as you know, I was an advocate general in many cases concerning new technologies, and hearing that there was a Facebook and Google uh, pleading before the court and uh, the council of Facebook said this is not technically possible and the council of another company said it is technically possible. So if the most developed companies do not have the same position on the certain issue, how do you expect the court to, to know what is technically possible and what is technically impossible? So that's one danger. And we have to leave it with. I, I cannot imagine that we will create courts that would be uh, that would have such a huge technical knowledge as uh, engineers from the most developed and influential platforms and uh, and uh, internet giants. So what they could look at simply what is equitable, what is just, and uh, and base this decision on these principles. So that's one. Uh, one obstacle, and another is uh, maybe some of you, you uh, definitely you, Anya, you are aware of this discussion. To what extent, to whom should the administration of justice and, co and courts belong? To the states uh, or to private entities? There is a huge tendency of self-regulation. You know, each system, each system, each each platform. Uh, has an ambition to create its own uh, dispute resolution mechanism. Uh, the tendency is definitely welcome that uh, you have this system, but, uh, and I can say with full conviction, this should not deprive individuals who are seeking justice from going to ordinary state courts. So all these alternative dispute resolution systems created by, by all users cannot be exhaustive. There should be always a possibility for an individual who considers that his or her rights were violated to go to a court, to a state court. 
Uh, I see that there are questions. I have one last, if you bear with me. Um, I think um, uh, it's uh, part of what we are looking into in our community, which is the not only not only Wikimedia, uh, but but also other um, other partners and 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 organizations. Is that uh, what we ended up with right now? Is that basically we have this kind of online public sphere that is actually on private playground, right? Yeah. This is, an, uh, I think, an obvious observation. And there is a lot of conversation, which I think better late than never, is, uh, well, should we have um, um, a, a digital public space, right? And if we do, what, that, what does it mean? Is it uh, something that is community organized and community governed, such as mm. Wikipedia and our project? Is there space for public investment into those uh, uh, technologies and infrastructure that can, that can hold it, that has uh, maybe a bit of a more of a different level of, uh, uh, well, basically defining what are the rules, right? So, um, we also see this with AI just because it's such an investment to create those uh, algorithms, uh, you know, pay those yeah. wonderful engineers and then finally get the data mm. that it also becomes, uh, I think, between, um, I don't know uh, who is now in the game or not, but I would assume three, four maybe players, right, yeah. that, that are basically chasing right now. Yeah. Um, now we know that Google uh, basically have an exclusive uh, agreement with Reddit. Uh, again, good luck with that, but yeah. uh, <laughs> to uh, for, for use for uh, AI. So also so those alliances are becoming um, um, more uh, more common. Uh, I'm wondering if uh, you know if, if you think also AI now that it's still in this nascent sa state, and we you know are observing this very rapid but still emergence. If this is also an area of public intervention uh, in that aspect, and also if there's regulation, then that should yeah. follow this. If we think that's a good idea, it is, and I always believe in public in public regulation. This is, after, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's always responsibility of public authorities with its legitimacy stemming from, from voters, from the will of the voters to regulate these aspects. But let me uh, finish this part because then I think we'll give the floor to the audience by saying one, uh, pointing out one very important aspect that makes this, that makes this picture much more complicated. That all digital sphere, what, everything what is linked to the internet, we have a problem with the regulation for a very simple reason that internet and uh, digitalization is delocalized. You know, the traditional ap approach in law was based on territoriality. So each, each state with its own uh, authorities elected in a democratic manner uh, had the right to legislate on its own territory. So a Polish legislator legislated on everything what's happening in Poland, Swedish legislator legislated on everything what's happening in Sweden, European Union with its competences legislates on everything which uh, territorially belongs to the Union. But this system doesn't work in digital work. So what happens, and it's my observation where I'm looking how these big platforms operating globally acting, they, try, they definitely respect the legislation only of big players, like US, European Union, China, India, Brazil. Uh, for obvious reasons, it's very difficult to someone who is acting globally to conform to all, I don't know how many countries we have in the world and how many legislators, 200 something probably, yes, if we look at the yeah, if, if, if we look at the General Assembly of the, of the United Nations. So that's a crucial problem, that it's easy to legislate something by an individual state, but it's very difficult to execute this legislation. So this is something we have to try to cope. The Union, and I think it's for a good reason that the Union took the initiative to regulate some aspect of new technologies, also the artificial intelligence. I believe... Uh, that the legislation of the union is the legislation that protects to the largest extent fundamental rights. And I believe that, that the approach we adopted towards different aspects of new technologies uh, would serve as a certain pattern, as a certain guideline for the rest of the world. Um, I'm also uh, very uh, fond of the active role that the EU has. I'm not always so fond of the results, but mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think mm -hmm. the, the the efforts is the first. 
the floor is yours. I know there is a question here. Maybe I will be the microphone person. Christian. Hi, Christian from Wikimedia Deutschland. We had now the first German uh, court case uh, in Hamburg regarding the usage um, of um, uh, data for uh, AI. And the question is that uh, there can be a machine-readable reservation that you don't want that this uh, data is used. And all the court has to decide like what form this machine-readable has to be. I'm interested if you have an opinion on that. And my second question is, you started by saying this thought that maybe you have to rethink IP law. I found that rather surprising to think that in the context of the rise of AI, because if we think about the impact, the impact will be that the AI oligopoly, which we have already, will just become stronger if we think of investment. And I think it's always input criteria you're referring to. And we rather have to think about impact criteria when we look at the effects of law, I believe. And um, we see that the market has failed regarding platforms for so many years. And my question is, why is it failing? Do we have to think closer the relationship between cartel law and uh, 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 intellectually property law? Because capitalism is kaput, basically, if we look at the digital world. And we have to fix capitalism in a way. And how can that be done? And why is that not happening through the European courts? Well, the first question was very precise, and the second aspect of your question was very broad. And I, I, I mean, you you presented the point of view that will definitely need to be uh, need to be taken into account. I didn't give any definite answers regards this investment in uh, investment based protection. I said that this discussion is actually also in uh, German literature very present. Uh, and I fully agree that the, that the reservation you mentioned would, def would, would, would need to be taken into account if we think uh, about uh, um, the most uh, adapted to, the, to, the, to um, the current challenges way of protecting, uh, protecting exclusive rights. Because one thing I'm convinced, uh, when internet emerged, uh, there were voices, let's say that there is no protection of exclusive light, uh, rights over the internet. And that would base on the assumption that then everything would be free and no one would make huge money out of it. But I think that the, that, uh, the time proved that if we, if we would say there is, for example, no copyright protection of the internet, it wouldn't mean that everything would be for, for free because the other giants would gather this information and make sure that it's paid for by other means, yes? essentially, essentially by your personal data. But it's sufficient and it's sufficiently dangerous from the point of view of the society. So uh, thanks for, for these remarks, they are very pertinent. And regards this technical, uh, I haven't heard about this case in Hamburg, I heard about the case in New York, where, where I think it's the New York Times that actually uh, is uh, suing one of the system of artificial intelligence for for being nourished by uh, by all the editions of New York Times and, ma and making huge money out of it. Then there is a question of protection: how certain texts should be protected. And it reminds me the discussion we had at the Court of Justice. By the way, uh, there were references from Bund uh, from Bundesgerichtshof. Uh, on uh, framing uh, in simply incorporating uh, over the internet in uh, incorporating um, the works of others into your own website so you uh, uh, through linking and uh, I remember that in this case the court said that uh, if you don't want at, as, a, as an owner for example of a photograph that this photography is incorporated by other systems, it's linked some, uh, to the system, you should uh, provide some technical measures that uh, you just give a signal that you do not want this picture to be, uh, to be linked in by, uh, by, by other websites. Uh, we are, um, so it was not as, that essential that the system is 100% effective but you just give a signal that you do not want to, to mm, the system to be, uh, to be used. Um, you know, uh, then the court, the court of justice was criticized that this approach is, um, is, 
is not compatible with the uh, idea of protection of ex ex exclusive rights. So if you leave your bicycle on the street and you do not lock it, does it mean that you allow other people to steal this bicycle? I would say no. You steal, you steal the, the owner. So with the system, I mean, uh, I don't know what, let's, let's wait for the, uh, for the decision of, this, of, the, of the decision of the court in Hamburg. Maybe they refer the question to the Court of Justice. Who knows, because it's a bit, that I look forward. <laughs> All the interesting problems and uh, in Luxembourg. Um, do we have any other questions? I do hope we do. Oh, Delia. No. Perfect. Thanks. Hi, I'm Delia Brown. I'm the chair of Creative Commons, but my other hat is I'm the national copyright director for all the schools and vet sector in Australia. So struggling with a lot of these issues. But I just wanted to have a couple of points here. We've been looking at preference tools as a way of also going forward in Creative Commons, so we look forward to kind of doing more exploration work with this community and others about that. But in relation to the idea of like compensation and payment, and you were men mentioning the idea of a levy, I, I believe, of some sort. I just wanted to give um, a perspective from Australia where we have a statutory licence scheme for educational use, um, which is a compulsory licence scheme which covers all education institutions in Australia. Now, in theory, it's a great idea from a public policy perspective, but it does mean that lots of public interest uses that would be in exceptions in other parts of the world are actually paid for by the taxpayer in Australia. So there's a danger sometimes of going down a compulsory licensing scheme. Also, no guarantee that money goes anywhere near back to the creator because of unequal bargaining power. Often no. the creator has to assign or sell their rights, particularly in publishing. So what I notice when we pay millions of dollars no. to collecting societies, that a very, very small percentage of that would actually go back to the creator itself. There are some interesting concepts in Europe that are good to think about, like an unwaivable right to remuneration. There's also some other interesting concepts like levies. Now, in Australia, we have things called the education lending right, the public lending right. It's paid for by the Australian government. That's where authors get their money from, more than they do from the licence fees that we pay to a collecting society under the statutory licence. So I just want to put those ideas into your head. But also, public interest exceptions are super important. Um, and you also talk about investment in time, and I go, that's a... Again, think about a lot of the time people are creating stuff, they have spending time, not necessarily investment. So you might be someone who is, takes a long time to be recognised as an artist or creator. Uh, think about that as well. Um, so it's, it's complicated. So I think the compensation question concerns me because it, it's sort of demanding that there, there should always be a, cons, comp, a compensation for use. And I, it just concerns me that we're... We're going into rights holders' hands, and the same people who get the money now are the same people who are going to get the money in the future, and it's not really going to help those who are the creators. Yes, indeed. I mean that that uh, the the co concerns you mentioned from your Australian ex uh, ex experience are, are also valid for Europe, and uh, the system of this. Uh, uh, compensation for the use of uh, uh, photocopying equipment is based on this assumption there's absolutely no guarantee that the money in the sufficient amount would go to to invert to those who work on it but for, for, but for me there's no when I speak about protection of copyright based on investment there is no doubt for me that uh, the time is an investment that uh, that uh, so uh, it's it, it's it's it cannot be it cannot be restricted to pure financial investment. That is clear and, uh, and out of the question. Thank you. Uh, please, Stefano. Hi, uh, Stefano Mafulli from the Open Source Initiative. Um, so we've been thinking about the concept of open source for AI. So in other words, how do we how do we generate? How do we think about the the the, the propagation of of knowledge inside the AI space? And um, uh, so I I wanted to ask your like kind of provocative like um, you talked about ChatGPT uh, being making money out of the nourishing out of uh, the Wikipedia and the volunteer work. Um, at the same time, you were talking about the, the quantity of data being important for good machine learning, machine translations, right? So um, having Google 
Google has already absorbed and nourished all of the of all, not all of the knowledge from the internet, and it gives us back free, uh, gratis search, although we pay for it in other ways. And um, but we we get search, and so why do you think? How do you the the court should have to think about this nourishing for search, different from the nourishing from automatic and good machine learning, based on you know the the production of the work of volunteers. Well, I would say that this is not the task of judiciary, but rather for the legislator. And, you know, with all uh, issues, cases concerning new technologies that the Court of Justice we have, we are facing this problem uh, that do we have sufficient legitimacy to answer this question that should be actually, in the first place, answered by uh, legislators elected in a democratic way. Uh, I sometimes, as a, as, a, as a member of the court, have this impression that we are facing a very important dilemma. And I could give you dozens, dozens of, of, of examples. And I can have a feeling which solution should, is it's, uh, just and, and equitable. But at the end of the day, I have a feeling that it is for the legislator with its own democratic legitimacy to decide this question. So the dilemma that you mentioned in the ideal world should be should be should be decided by by legislators. Yes. So I you know there is no public debate in the court when you have a, uh, uh, an appropriate legislative procedure. You have voices of all stakeholders. Everyone is well informed. The court functions in a completely function. The courts uh, function completely different circumstances. We have just the files, what the parties presented. We have very strict time limits when the opinion should be delivered, when the judgment should be delivered. So this uh, deliberative democracy, it's very, very limited in the case of, uh, of judiciary. Yeah, no. Like, I mean, the best example is Article 17 of the Copyright Directive. I mean, it, uh, this is how to reconcile the freedom of speech with the protection of, uh, of, um, of exclusive rights. And uh, uh, to what extent you can impose on big platforms this filtering system. After all, we are, we are dealing with two or three fundamental rights, data protection, um, freedom of speech, uh, questions of liability for infringements, protection of property, and uh, the legislator, the legislator, created uh, a legal provision, Article 70, 17, that doesn't say a lot, and and at the end of the day leaves everything to judicial authorities that sometimes do not have sufficient legitimacy to to decide so, such fundamental questions. I guess we have uh, one more point into our uh, <laughs> policy and advocacy to um, to add. Um, any other questions? Alec. Hello, my name is Alek Tarkovsky. I work at Open Future, we're a European think tank for digital commons. Uh, I have one just comment listening to you. I think it's indeed very interesting, this point you make about the role of legislative and the role of courts. It's interesting with AI, everyone now is looking at the big court cases in the US on fair use, and I just realized it's interesting we don't have such cases in Europe. Well, we, you have your well the German one, but yeah. and, and maybe it'll grow to be the symbolic case, because really the American cases are, are sort of gripping everyone's attention, they're shaping the debate, or actually the lack of decision yet. It, it, from this perspective, to me, it seems somehow the European model feels that maybe the decisions made, interestingly enough, just before generative AI with the copyright directive somehow feel, you know, more, I don't know, future-proof, stable. That's for me interesting. But I have a different question. Um, we work a lot on AI policy, and we, there's this growing debate on concentrations of power. I would almost say that after a year where everyone was ignoring it as a risk, I really feel we were talking about 
as you talk things like liability, but also all the existential risks that I personally don't really believe in. And somehow the concentrations of power, if you would look at documents that try to uh, make a typology of risk, it would really be, a, for me, a, like a, a gap, you know, like some kind of missing thing. I think the, in the last months I'm seeing more and more. So I have a more general question um, what's your thinking about the role of, 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 you know, of antitrust law, of law targeted at concentrations of power? It seems to me that something that was once a lot about markets is now about all of society. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for this question because we didn't tackle in the beginning and we should have done so because that's a, that's a very, very important, I think it's one of the biggest challenges for for the use of artificial intelligence and, and new technologies in general. Um, indeed, I mean, your observation are, 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 are definitely accurate. Uh, and I would like to draw your attention uh, to the role of big platforms, uh, big internet giants, because traditionally, and also, you know, every lawyer has this perspective to divide uh, the legal system on public law and what can be imposed on public authorities and then uh, private law uh, and individuals, entrepreneurs. But let's be frank, uh, and this distinction is based that public authorities are much stronger. They can use, you know, the, the uh, all ways of enforcement which cannot be done by, by individuals. But can we say that, let's say, Google or Facebook are, are individuals and uh, with a huge market power, just uh, I can tell you that uh, in one of the cases when I was, uh, there was a hearing in Luxembourg at the court and uh, one of the parties said, yes, we are talking about, I do not want to mention this company because every, every, everyone knows this company, he said, we are talking about this company X, but in reality, uh, the, the turnover of the company X is uh, much bigger than... Uh, the national product of three Baltic states taken together. So that's reality. And uh, what brings me to two observations, that in the first place, this distinction that we can impose something uh, only on public authorities and individuals are just, uh, can be driven by the, pr by the uh, profit mechanism is no longer valid. And I think it also refers partly to your question that we should also impose some public responsibilities on, on, in, on individual companies. This is the approach taken, maybe some of you know, the union uh, one year ago adopted two legal instruments, Digital Services Act and Digital Markets Act. And especially in Digital Services Act, this is the regulation of the European Union, there is the categorization of, uh, of uh, internet intermediaries and the fourth, uh, fourth category of uh, uh, very large online platforms. So if you qualified as a very large online platforms, public authorities may impose on you some public obligations. I think uh, this approach is a very accurate approach. If you have such a huge power, you need to assume some social responsibility. Uh, this is, I would say, something on the borderline between competition law, but also enforcement of public law. So not only the state, the state sometimes are very weak in comparison to, 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 to huge internet giants. And that's probably the reason, and that's the assumption uh, from which uh, the European legislator departed, that in certain circumstances, uh, you can impose on these big giants some kind of social and public responsibility. Any other questions? I see your hand. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Machi, for joining us. Uh, it was super interesting. Uh, for me, I hope for, for everyone. Thank you all for questions. Uh, this is a conversation that is an ongoing one for you, <laughs> for us, and hopefully no conclusion. <laughs> exactly, and hopefully, uh, and hopefully for us together at yeah. at some point. Let's let's see how this things goes. Indeed, I I can only say that um, uh, 
I, I also am um, myself and I think also our organization, because it, this is also our goal to participate in public debates with lawmakers about the shape of the law and bringing in this perspective from this uh, other corner of Internet that is the communities that... Um, uh, that do the work we do, uh, we do believe in in the legitimacy aspects and in the uh, in the deliberative aspect of creating law with interested stakeholders. But I must also say that um, I am uh, really also reassured that if the legislator uh, either is not very responsive to the to our points or just needs to put those points together, and therefore, as in the case of Article 17, let's say that the wording is not the best uh, lawmaking we've seen, right? So, um, uh, so delegates to court, I'm, I'm very uh, happy and reassured that we have the European Court of Justice that can uh, help us straighten out those uh, uh, legal conundrums uh, with the citizens and communities like ours in mind. So thank you for being with us here and thank you for being with us through your work. Thank um, you and my big appreciation to your work. Thank you. <laughs>